So I'm speaking today with Roger Spitz, the co-author of the forthcoming book, The Definitive Guide to Thriving on Disruption. Uh, Roger is also president of Technistential and chairman of the Disruptive Futures Institute. And I understand, Roger, that you welcome the opportunity to discuss how individuals can use the methods that Israel has embraced to generate great success. Welcome to the Israel Connection, Roger. Thank you so much, David. My pleasure and absolutely. Now, Roger is speaking to us from San Francisco and joining us on this conversation is David Solomon, who is located close to Tel Aviv, to Tel Aviv in Israel, I understand. Yeah, that's right. Hi, hi, David. Hi, Roger. Glad to be here. And I understand, David, that you spent 36 years of service in leadership positions with the Israeli army and thereafter in the prime minister's office reaching the equivalent rank of Major General. But perhaps you can tell us a bit more about your background and how you've come to be in collaboration with Roger for his book on disruption. Yeah, uh, thanks, David. Um, I think the best way to describe uh, my, my professional career is that I spent three and a half decades solving or trying to, to solve, and I think some of them, some sometimes or most times successfully, solving some of Israel's most complex security uh, challenges. I think that's the best way the best way to describe it. And when Roger was on his fact finding tour in Israel, uh, we met up, and uh, I think we both had the same fascination about how leaders and teams and individuals deal with uh, with disruption. Um, understanding that you know the the disruption today that we're facing today is 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 basically exponential. Uh, things are changing so quickly that I think we, a lot of people feel that the ground is kind of, uh, or the rug is being pulled from underneath their feet, and we need new frameworks and new and new toolkits and new mindsets uh, to deal with uh, with disruption. So we've got a little bit of a background about both of you guys. Can you tell us what is the target audience for the book, the definitive guide to thriving on disruption? Sure. So I think if I had the same question some years ago, I would have probably had a more narrow target audience. Um, in my mind, it was always applicable to pretty much a lot of the world, any age, any background, any level of education, any type of work. And I still feel that's the case. Five or 10 years ago, the answer to the question would have probably been that these kind of topics, decision making and complexity, uncertainty and unpredictability, were maybe more targeted at uh, fellow futurists, some academics, business people, technologists, and, and the like. I think what the pandemic showed and some of the recent geopolitical events is that actually decision-making and uncertainty and complexity is probably one of the most important states of, of our environment and, and the need to be able to operate in that environment is actually essential for everyone. And so, now, what I found is that since we've come live with many talks and some of this material and the publications, the target audience is actually very big. It's individuals as much as professionals, business people, any age, whether you're wondering what to do with your life or to study, what careers to think about, how to think about life or careers themselves, whether you're a parent thinking about the future of your children, whether you're a professional that thinks you're in a good position and wondering how the world will unfold, whether you're an innovator, whatever it is. So technically, I I think this kind of topic, like it or not, is actually essential um, for, for pretty much most of the world. All right. So anybody who's listening, stay tuned, I think, uh, because I think it's going to be pertinent to you for sure. And to, but today we're focusing on one particular chapter of volume two of a four volume series that comprises the Definitive Guide to Thriving on Disruption. Now, in Chapter 8 of Volume 2 of the book, you highlight the particular achievements of Israel by referring to how Israel showcases the power of what is referred to as the six eyes. Now, can, someone, can either of you explain, please, what are the six eyes and how does Israel manage to stand out as a top performer according to this categorization? Perhaps, Roger, you want to explain? Sure. So I'll give some context. I'm sure later on, David will have great examples on, on the ground. Um, 
to contextualize indeed, we have four volumes. One is really the foundations to understand what is the nature of, of change and what is complexity and what is uncertainty and, and that. Volume two, which is the one we're focusing on, is really to understand what frameworks are available to actually help with disruption and uncertainty. And in those, we have a number which are you know, derived from the futures and foresight field, how to be anticipatory, how to think about the foundations as anti-fragile and a number of other things. And what we wanted to do is go beyond the kind of resilience and adaptation for, for change and disruption. And actually think that as disruption is a constant, as it's systemic, we wanted frames that are more, let's say, that you enjoy, that you can thrive, literally thrive, as the title suggests, on disruption. And so we thought about the six eyes, which are intuition, how to avoid preconceptions, how to trust yourself, inspiration to explore and be curious, imagination to be thinking more broadly than you might, to think in a discontinuous way, improvisation, you know, with a sense of experimentation, Invention, where you not only invent other things, but actually invent your own beingness, which may be discontinuous, which may be changing. And the impossible, where you can wander with confidence, fail, stumble upon maybe things that might seemingly be impossible. So where does this framework originate? It's not uh, uniquely developed for this particular book that you've written. It's a broader framework, isn't it, Roger? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's nothing necessarily proprietary per se. What I kind of found when I was researching and speaking to, to many different people and forming my own ideas and reading some amazing, you know, um, thought leadership on these topics is that once you go beyond just simply the adaptation or the resilience, what are the aspects which make you really feel positive about it? And so these were common ingredients, let's say, you know, whether it's the intuition that Steve Jobs describes, or whether it's the thinking about the impossible, like Michio Kaku, about going beyond what are the levels of impossibility, whether it's the role of improvisation. And to be perfectly honest, I had to kind of, to make them the six eyes, think long and hard about what was cohesive. But fundamentally, it did revolve around intuition, inspiration, imagination, um, innovation or invention, what is the impossible, which brings you to that level, which is not just let me survive and not be hit by disruption or knocked down or something, but actually let me find enjoyment, let me thrive on it, let me drive the disruption itself rather than being a sort of vulnerable subject. Um, let, let me make the most of it. Let me just accept that it's part of humanity's freedom, agency, and choice. Here, in going through your uh, chapter, uh, you put it succinctly, and I, I'll just repeat. Combine improved intuition with real-time improvisation to adapt to changing circumstances and imagine new possibilities. Then inspire yourself to invent your future and achieve the impossible. That rounds it, that six eyes all into one, uh, one short phrase that covers the whole spectrum that uh, you're, you're, you're talking about. But in, yeah, now, in, in was, developing uh, a, a culture of impact and tenacity, you write that there are two overriding themes that contribute to Israel's particular reputation as a world innovation leader. Now, can you tell us, David, what are these two themes that uh, emerge from uh, this chapter? Yeah, um, first, of, first of all, I'll say that um, it's my understanding that leaders and teams that deal effectively with adversity uh, will, will have a competitive edge. And that is, the first, um, that is the first overriding theme. And I think in order to deal well with the adversity and with the disruption, you have to embrace it. You have to be tolerant of failure and you have to be comfortable uh, with risk taking. Uh, and, and following on from there, Roger and I try to understand what, this, what Israel's what lessons can be learned from Israel's um, case study um, and what is the secret source? And I think the, 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 the themes are, are broadly uh, a healthy risk appetite, which I think Israel has, uh, a, a disregard of formal hierarchy, uh, counter-establishment mindset to a degree, uh, a solution-driven uh, approach, which is also an overriding theme in, in the chapter, 
And what we what we in the in the military what we call operational optimism, which loosely translates into like it's nothing nothing is impossible. There are no problems; there are only challenges. And basically, any challenge uh, can be can be solved. Um, picking up on the uh, on the issue of failure, which I think is very important. I think being tolerant of failure means developing a no a no blame culture within within the organization. Um, and and creating also a strong debrief and lessons learned methodology, which also comes, uh, which is also a theme that we talk about uh, in the chapter. Um, and this allows for invention and iteration uh, as a pro as a process for achieving uh, the desired uh, result. I think the third thing is the Israelis themselves. I think Israelis by DNA are, are extremely competitive. Um, they're con constantly challenging the status quo. They question everything. They're pretty argumentative, and they take very little little for granted. Um, they also have a healthy disrespect, a built-in disrespect for hierarchy. So our organizations in Israel tend to be pretty pretty loose in that sense, where everyone within the hierarchy uh, can can voice uh, and, and is expected to voice uh, their opinions. Um, I think this, uh, together with a feeling of constantly being under threat. I mean, we live in a pretty rough neighborhood uh, here, and, and I think Israeli history uh, and Jewish history uh, is also um, also teaches us that we can't uh, just sit back and feel comfortable. But uh, it seems to have frozen, David. Okay, yeah, am I back with you? Yeah, yeah. Just a moment. You okay. seem to have got frozen. I hope you're okay. Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No worries. You you pointed out that Israel has uh, the world's highest per capita number of startups, and that uh, failure is uh, is is accepted of the startups that Israel generates. What is the failure rate? Do you have a, a figure that you can give us? Yeah. Well, I think that, again, uh, the failure the failure rate is probably or, or the success rate is probably one in twenty, more or less. It very much depends, you know, what, what stage we're talking about. But I think, in general, that's 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 a pretty impressive uh, failure rate. One one startup out of twenty succeeding. Hmm. Yeah, that gives people the impression that uh, that failure is almost inevitable. And it is in, in, like in that. Yeah. Hmm. Totally. Now, given Israel's impressive outcomes in research, science, technology, and business. It may come as a shock that the formal Israeli education system deserves very little credit. Instead, the credit for the country's innovative success belongs more squarely on the shoulders of three different eyes that we haven't mentioned, informal education, immigration, and the IDF. Now, could either of you please explain these factors that are very evident in Israel and that your book states can be applied even uh, elsewhere? Uh, yeah, Roger. Maybe I'll take I'll take this one. I think um, right. the the first um, the first uh, uh, advantage is the is, is Israeli culture, which I, I think I expanded on uh, previously. The Israeli DNA. I think, um, as you mentioned, our, our formal education system is is average at best, and uh, kids, I think, are. are basically receive their informal education through youth movements, um, through, through gap years uh, that almost all Israelis take before, uh, before drafting into the army. And I think uh, the army is a, key, is a key factor in Israel's success. Israel has a conscripted uh, army. It's, a, it's the people's army. So basically everyone is expected uh, to serve. Uh, the army is very, um, is very technological. In the way it approaches the modern uh, battlefield and, and and training, so there's a lot of technology embedded within uh, within the Israeli army. So people are coming into contact uh, not only with a with a with a mindset with a with a winner's mindset, but also um, in, with a lot of technology, which is afterwards you know they they take with them afterwards to to the startup ecosystem. Um, immigration has always played a key role uh, in Israel. There have been a number of waves of immigration, but just to give an example, uh, the immigration from uh, from the ex-Soviet Union in the 90s uh, brought a lot of um, 
highly educated uh, Russian Jews into Israel, mainly in the fields of engineering uh, and mathematics. Uh, and that gave us a, a huge uh, competitive advantage um, and boost. Well, of course, and you're an immigrant yourself, aren't you, David, from uh, South Africa, I believe? Yes, I am. I am. I, I came to Israel as a teenager, and, and uh, you know, it's 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 very it's very common in Israel. We're we're a huge melting pot of uh, of Jews from all over the world. Now we've spoken about these uh, six eyes uh, earlier on. I want to focus perhaps on one of them, uh, namely improvisation. Uh, the way that the IDF operates. Uh, is based, I understand, on occurrences and reactions. That's a model that they follow, and there's this Hebrew term, maktag, that refers to it. Could you explain the relevance of this concept to how we can manage disruption? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, it's, a, a, it's, it's our understanding that, a, that, that plans will inevitably uh, change in once, once a, a team goes into the field. Um, so, in order to um, to prepare to prepare well for that eventuality, we like to stress test, test our plan, and we stress test our plan using uh, occurrences and reactions or contingencies. I think is a is a word that's maybe broadly uh, used internationally, um, and this has this has two two main objectives. One objective um, is to find weak points in the operational planning. Um, and uh, and iron them out before uh, a team will go into the field for an operation. And uh, the second uh, objective is to create a, a common language, uh, which is used between the team in the field and the commanders back in HQ uh, to deal with uh, with eventualities that invariably uh, that invariably will occur. So that that's it. Um, I, th I don't know if it's uniquely uh, Israeli, but it's very widely used in in Israeli operational planning in the, in the military and uh, in Israeli uh, security apparatus. And I think it's something that you you know that it's a toolkit. It's a tool that could be used also uh, in the context of business and uh, and uh, uh, the startup ecosystem. So, what does the word maktag mean in Hebrew? Again, it means occurrences, mikrim vidguvot. The, 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 it's it's a, an acronym. So it's occurrences and reactions. Uh, how you will react to, to an unexpected uh, occurrence in, in, in the field. Okay, for listeners now who are listening to uh, our discussion, I'm speaking with uh, Roger Spitz and uh, David Solomon about the book, The Definitive Guide to Thriving on Disruption. And to give us a little bit of uh, context, uh, can we perhaps uh, shift to a consideration of of COVID, the uh, what we've just been going through all over the world, and how managing COVID uh, becomes a, a great exemplar of how we need to deal with disruption. So I can I can give a an outside view and then it'd be amazing to have David's um, on the ground view who who lived it but one aspect which I find very interesting and this is in a sense why we use Israel as a showcase to power our six eyes is that COVID almost is a prime example of the inventiveness whether it's the startups themselves that they raised you know I think in 2021 one and a half to two times more funding than they had in 2020, which is a pretty good year for startups anyway, in Israel and elsewhere, where there's the imagination as to how they dealt with the, the COVID situation itself, the vaccination programs, which um, um, David will talk about, where there's the improvisation, which, you know, there's a term I love, which is, you know, balagan, which is the state of chaos with the promise of opportunity. And I almost feel that these kind of environments are kind of conducive to to thinking about the impossibilities, the challenges which David was talking about. There's not a problem. There's only, you know, a challenge to be to be addressed, or there's not nothing's impossible. Um, and with the flair and the sometimes the intuition or the inspiration to keep going despite um, a certain context. So when I look at the polarization of much of the world, when I look at the stumbling blocks around the vaccination programs, when I look at how a lot of the world came to a standstill. 
literally for for many aspects of society of business of startups and when i look at kind of how innovative israel was um, in so many aspects i really feel that it touches upon those those six eyes quite well but i'd love maybe david can put some flesh on the ground on, on very more specific aspects um of that COVID era you know era it's probably not finished but anyway that that initial phase let's say uh yeah sure um i think i think that uh, the key to to Israel successfully dealing with uh, with the pandemic was our ability to identify very early the challenge of getting back uh, to a state of uh, to a state of normal as quickly as possible. Um, you know, for social reasons, for economic reasons, it was very important, and we realized pretty early on that a zero COVID policy was not going to was not going to get us there. That was that was the first thing. Um, second thing is we because we're a small country, um, we were able to mobilize our government. Uh, the military um, and the other security organizations uh, very quickly uh, to deal with uh, with the pandemic. Uh, there was clear prioritization of who does what between the different uh, between the different bodies, um, with 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 a clear ob objective. Um, so I think what 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 we did is 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 we pretty we we beat the rest of the world uh, out of the blocks. Um, and I think we, we, we took our competitive, uh, our competitive advantage of being a very innovative, small country, both in size and in terms of population. And we leveraged that to, pers to persuade Pfizer to use us as a, as a, as a, like a, a laboratory or a test case uh, for their vaccines. So we got the vaccines very, very early. And again, because, because it's, a, it's a small country, we were able to vaccinate the population um, uh, relatively quickly and and get back uh, get back to normal. Um, I think we had one of the uh, the shortest lockdowns if you in comparison uh, uh, to other countries worldwide. And I think it's a good example of of, of quick mobilization, uh, um, ingenuity, and innovative out of the box thinking. And uh, again, a good it's a good it's a, it's a good solution driven problem um, example. Um, uh, to use. Yeah, I should say that um, China should um, be looking at what Israel did. Their zero COVID policy continues until uh, until this very day, and uh, we can see what the impact has been on the Chinese uh, population in coping with a zero COVID policy. And I can also mention the experience we had, uh, particularly in Victoria here in Australia, where our uh, our premier imposed on us uh, some of the, the longest um, lockdowns that were seen anywhere uh, in the world, which caused a lot of uh, discomfort in the community, although we did have elections only a month ago, and it seems like he's been forgiven because he was voted in with almost the same majority. But be that as it may. Uh, so uh, there's one other one other thing that uh, that comes out of your uh, book, or this chapter that uh, perhaps could be worth explaining, and that is what is called the Israeli Anti-Fragility Toolkit. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, could be of, uh, of some interest, I think, to listeners. Do you want to explain what, what that is all about? Sure. So I can pick up on the, uh, the idea of anti-fragility. And uh, it's a term which is coined by um, Nassim Taleb, who wrote, who was pretty um, keen on the topic of uncertainty because he wrote a, a five volume collection called Inserto. And one of them is anti fragility. And the idea is the following the idea is that when you're looking at a change or shocks or randomness or what we call disruption, not only do you want to not break um, or be resilient and adapt, but there are ways of having foundations which allow you to benefit from those disruptions and from those shocks. And the, one of the key ideas about anti-fragility, and this is very applicable to complex systems, is that it's asymmetric because complex systems are nonlinear. In other words, if something bad or problematic happens, it doesn't matter that it's just 1% risk of happening. If that wipes up the entire company or your country or the world, that's serious. And you can't look at things just on a probabilistic basis, but on the outcomes, and that is asymmetric. Incidentally, it works both ways for positive as well. So some of the things which are 
derived from anti-fragility are really important in a complex world because so the trial and error, the failing, the experimentation, um, those are features which are necessary for complex, uncertain environments. And so the idea of anti-fragility is that you need resilience, but you want to go beyond resilience to be anti-fragile. And that is a major theme which we have in, in that particular volume, volume two of our uh, of frameworks, and indeed, I'll, I'll pass the relay stick to to David to give his flavor on how we then put a spin on Nassim Taleb's anti-fragility from a kind of Israel perspective and talk it. Yeah, um, thanks, Roger. I think I think uh, the four C's is the best way to describe uh, to describe uh, how we prepare. Uh, ourselves and how we prepare teams and how we prepare organi organizations to be anti-fragile. I think the first C is culture. And I think it's very important to create a corporate culture that embraces disruption, that re rewards improvisation, creative thinking, iterative planning, uh, has a balanced uh, risk-taking appetite, um, encourages blameless debriefing and, and implementation of lessons learned. So I think the first C is, um, is, is culture. Uh, working on the organization's uh, culture, leaders need to need to to, uh, to work on the organization's culture. Uh, the second is collaboration. I think uh, I think it's it's not a new concept, but I think working in in compartmented silos enhances fragility, and it doesn't build organizational resilience to su to succeed. I think teams and and departments need to break down barriers and learn to collaborate in almost a plug and play way. Um, yes. or plug and play mode where required. Um, the next thing is cooperation. I think uh, it, it's important to emphasize an incentive that you know emphasize and incentivize uh, employees and leaders to work on their interpersonal skills, to work well together with colleagues and, and build strong teams. And then the last C is is capacity and uh, um, uh, force building is, is a term that we use in the, mil in the military, but what it basically means is building capacity within an organization um, in this context to deal, to deal with disruption. Um, and instead of anticipating or trying to forecast uh, the future, you want to build an organization that will deal well with any future or anything that the future will, uh, will throw at us. So th 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 that's a context. The four C's are something that I like to, to, to use when looking at uh, uh, anti-fragile. Yeah, David, I understand that this uh, anti-fragility toolkit, this Israeli version, has been adapted from a high-ranking IDF commander's personal methodology for anti-fragility. Is that uh, the case for use in intricate military operations? That's, that's where it stems from? Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of what we discussed today filters down from, from the military and into, um, and into the, the Israeli private sector. Um, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, IDF officers who migrate from from the military uh, and from the other organizations, uh, security organizations in Israel, uh, into the private sector. I myself, after retiring in in two thousand and nineteen, um, I'm, I'm working now as an angel investor uh, within the startup uh, ecosystem. So you take a lot of the um, the lessons learned and the and the and the ways of thinking. From, from the military career and then uh, use them in, uh, um, uh, in, in dealing with, with, with problems in, in the private sector. Well, I've been speaking today with uh, David Solomon and Roger Spitz about the series, the compendium, the definitive guide to thriving on disruption. Perhaps uh, you'd like to tell us, uh, Roger, about the availability of the book and the fact that uh, the volume that we've been talking about today is only going to be released very, very, very soon. Uh, thanks so much for that, David. So indeed, it's it's four volumes. The second volume, which um, is the one we're talking about around the six eyes and the frameworks for dealing with um, uncertainty and predictability and disruption, is out actually on Monday, 19th of December. And then the volume three will be out on in January, which is more beta your life, thinking of your individual life and, and change in that context. And then there's a business focus, how to leverage on disruption to create value, which is the fourth and final um, piece, which comes out in February. 
in terms of availability, they're available on Google. Uh, what am I saying? <laughs> well, you can Google it, but they're available on the, everything's available to Google, right? They're available on the, on Amazon. They're available on Barnes and Nobles. They're available to download on Apple Books, Kindle, um, most kind of. Uh, so would you uh, say the volumes. Ebook, ebook platforms. The volumes be self-contained. Would you need to get the whole compendium to get the value out of it? Or can you just go for one volume at a time? They're designed to be self-contained, and within that, to be, we tried our best to also make many of the concepts, the chapters, the frameworks self-contained as well. So you could read it from front to back, middle to back, left to right, right to left. Um, the idea is really not to have as a prerequisite that you read each volume or that you even read within each volume um, from A to Z. So they are meant to be self-contained and independent. I wouldn't say that these these volumes are, would be bedside reading. They're more uh, like uh, reference uh, guidebooks, aren't they, for, for people who are really interested in the subject we've been talking about today? Yeah, listen, it, it's, these are not easy topics. Um, and indeed, it's not a sort of lighthearted novel. Having said that, we tried our best to make them as user-friendly as possible with a lot of visuals we have over 500 visuals we have um, a lot of bullet points tables and um, like it or not the topics are more important by the day so we try to democratize topics which are often um, not treated as well as we would like or very specialized or technical we try to democratize um, topics which sometimes have barriers to entry or which are targeted at specific audience like just business to make them more um, helpful to a broader population but you're right it's it's by nature a kind of guidebook and not all the concepts are the same fun as uh, as some other novels or whatever you might find for sure it's really been great having this uh, conversation with both of you, David Solomon and Roger Spitz. Um, I uh, certainly uh, commend what you're doing to our listeners as uh, something that uh, is really relevant to all of us in some way or another. Thank you for your time today. Thank you both, David. It's wonderful to be on you and thank you for, for, the, for the invitation, um, David. Thank you very much.